But even if you don't have the obvious sins of the flesh, if you depend on the strength of the flesh, then the mirror is not facing the object of Jesus. You see, the mirror to reflect Jesus has to face him. And if you are self-focused, then they're just going to see you. And it's time they see Jesus. Are we a glow with Jesus? Second Corinthians chapter 3 in your Bibles, please. Second Corinthians chapter 3. And it is a delight to be back. I think this is the eighth meeting. The first time was back in 2005. Uh, so this is the eighth uh, time I've been here for a full uh, meeting. And uh, may the Lord breathe on us afresh and anew. And good to see you again. Good to see new faces as well. Looking forward to uh, getting to uh, know some uh, ones I haven't uh, uh, had a chance to meet yet. But good to see friends from uh, over these years. And some of the men have beards now. You know, we finally made it past the 1970s overreaction. <laughs> but uh, uh, at any rate, my son has a beard. He's the first Van Gelder with a beard in four generations. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, you say, why don't you have one, Brother John? Well, I got one of these Dutch chins that's already long enough as it is. But uh, uh, at any rate, uh, it's good to be back. May the Lord uh, make these days count. I've already been stirred to the music and what we've heard already uh, through the word in this service. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, let me thank um, you. I know many of you have uh, prayed leading up to these days. Thank you. And as we are starting this meeting, let me encourage you to keep praying. We need God to move. We need that spirit of the living Christ that was just sung about to just give life to speak truth to our innermost being, to manifest the presence of Jesus so that truth sinks in. And so let's ask the Lord to do that, indelibly impressing truth in our hearts so that Jesus becomes the living word to us. So let me encourage you to keep praying. And as Pastor mentioned, obviously we have several days in a row. You have more services than normal. So we have the opportunity for what we call the cumulative effect of preaching. Doesn't that sound good? <laughs> uh, but it's where you have uh, a bunch of services in a short period of time so that you can build truth upon truth and uh, kind of uh, uh, connect the dots and hopefully be able to remember the previous dot because <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. Uh, but uh, there is a compounding effect to that. Now, obviously, in order to benefit from that, uh, you would have to be here. And uh, I, 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 I understand schedules. I get all that. Most of what I do is in the evening. So I'm a second shifter myself. <laughs> but <laughs> let me encourage you. Would you come every service that God wants you to come? That's not a trick. And when we look to the Lord, he leads, and then it will be right, whatever that is. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 in the word of God this morning. It says, but we all, this is verse 18, with open face. Beholding as in a glass, that's a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image. That's astounding. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, friends, this is an incredible statement. That there can be a change, there can be a metamorphosis is the word underneath this. There can be a transformation from the inside out so that the glow of Jesus is actually manifested. And that beauty of holiness from the Holy One himself is so real that people actually see the Lord as they interact with you. I want to speak this morning on being a glow with Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes to the truth of this text in a way that we embrace the truth, that we respond in faith, and Lord, that we experience Jesus afresh and anew. Lord, you know the need of every heart here. I pray that you would meet that need. Lord, awaken where there needs to be awakening. Lord, where there needs to be salvation, Lord, arrest the attention of that one that is still headed to judgment. But Lord, open their eyes to the beauty of Jesus and the Jesus who saves. 
Lord, for those who already know you, would you deepen them in their walk? Lord, those who perhaps are just uh, going their own way, Lord, awaken them. Lord, who are, for some who are very much going through the right motions, but missing the real dynamic, Lord, bring them into that reality of Christ in them, manifest to them and through them out to others. So, Lord, wherever we are, use truth to set free. I do plead the blood, Lord, protect us from the attack of the enemy who would seek to hinder. Lord Jesus, I claim our position in you on the throne, far above all principality and power. And in your name, I exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek to hinder this at this time and trust you that that not be allowed. So Lord, as was just some, breathe on us. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, I was preaching in the country of South Africa. We were in an area of the country in the Northeast called Venda, uh, just uh, to the west of uh, what they call Kruger Park. Now, Kruger Park is a game park. It's a jungle. It's the real deal jungle. It's about the size of the nation of Israel or the state of Vermont. And uh, on the other side of that is the country of Mozambique. And back in those days, this was the 1990s when I was there. Uh, I'm not sure if this is still happening, but they had a lot of refugees coming through from Mozambique, uh, pouring uh, into South Africa, but taking a risk at going through that jungle. In fact, the pastor told me, he said, uh, I saw a lady come out of the jungle. She was weeping. I spoke with her. She said, I started on the other side with five children. I've arrived alone. Now that's desperation. I want us to try to picture a part of the world that is in desperation. We think we got it bad, but there's places where it's worse. And uh, this little village that's just uh, uh, to the uh, to the west of that Kruger Park where this pastor was at, it's called Mashamba. Remember the first time we went into that village, uh, we went by the open marketplace, which was the only marketplace, uh, to buy two live chickens to drop off at the chief's house on the way into that village. Standard protocol over there. You know, when I came in town, I did not drop off two live chickens with your mare. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is how they do it over there. And uh, fascinating. You know, in a village like this, this is the way it was back in the, uh, the 90s when I was there. Uh, the majority of the people, the vast majority, did not have electricity at all. Now, I've been in many parts of the world where they have it on and off throughout the day. But uh, they didn't have it at all. Chief did. Maybe one or two higher ups. That's it. Uh, so that means they did not have running water. Try to imagine life without running water, plumbing. We just take it for granted. And uh, most of these houses, uh, the floor level of the house was earth. It was an earthen floor. That's kind of like a Michigan basement. I'm from Michigan. Uh, but in Michigan, that's your basement, not your main level. And so uh, uh, there's uh, uh, there, uh, many of them had an earthen floor. Some had a cement floor. I stayed at the pastor's house. He'd grown up in that village, was uh, saved, called to preach, and I uh, started a church there. In his house, he had a cement floor. So uh, we slept on that cement floor. Nothing wrong with that. Had our blanket, got, uh, slept on the floor. Now, I got up in the morning. Now, the average American is used to maybe taking a, a shower, you know, get cleaned up, ready for the day. Well, it's not going to happen because they don't have running water. <laughs> they did have a barrel outside where somebody had hauled up some water and they would bring in a bowl full at a time into uh in the house there was a little room where they would put this bowl and uh uh it was like a restroom it was not a restroom the restroom was one of those outside kind but uh it was a little room with a bowl of water where you could get cleaned up and ready for the day the best you could so when it was my turn i came in and i took a look around and there was no mirror you ever tried to get ready without a mirror <laughs> Now, I realize that some look at the mirror longer than others. I get that. Some guys just grab their baseball hat and go. You know how it goes. So they, they may not need a mirror. Uh, but uh, most take a, at least a quick glance to make sure things are not in total disarray before they head out for the day. Well, I took a look around. There's no mirror. Now, I've learned in my travels, you always bring a travel mirror. So I pulled out my little travel mirror, stuck it on the windowsill. It was small. It was cocked. But I did the best I could. Combed my hair, got cleaned up the uh, best I could, and got ready for the day. Well, a couple of hours later, I had the privilege of preaching the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to 500 teenagers at their secondary school, their high school. What a neat thing. Now, they did not have an auditorium facility like this at all. So we met out in an open courtyard, and these 500 teenagers stood the entire time I preached and were not you know, looking elsewhere, they were they were right there listening. 
Now, I was mindful of the fact that they were standing, so I kept it on the shorter side. So if you think I'm going too long, you just stand up, <laughs> and I'll probably keep going. <laughs> but at any rate, as I was preaching, the missionaries behind me, he's got to get pictures to send home to the, uh, the home churches. You know how that goes. Uh, so you have the 500 faces looking up this way, uh, and he's behind me, so I'm, you know, preaching away. And uh, so he takes this picture. Now, this is back in the days when we developed film. Anybody remember? Okay. And uh, so it took a couple days. And I remember when they showed me that picture, I looked and the hair on the back of my head was sticking straight out. <laughs> my mother used to call it rooster tails. Uh, my wife calls it bed head. Well, whatever you want to call it, it was a bad hair day. And I remember looking at that picture thinking, oh, man, don't I have any friends? <laughs> Somebody could have warned me. Well, who knows? Maybe they thought it was some newfangled American hairstyle. <laughs> have you ever been in a scenario where you needed a mirror and you couldn't find one? You ever try the back of a spoon? But all you see is your nose. <laughs> and with a Dutch nose like mine, it's a little disconcerting. <laughs> I remember one time I was in a scenario and I needed a mirror and I was looking around. I couldn't find anything. And then I saw a metal doorknob. <laughs> So when nobody's looking, I'm looking at the doorknob, <laughs> trying to catch a clear reflection, but it was dull and I couldn't catch a clear reflection and it was frustrating. Now in our text, the word glass is the concept of a mirror. We're going to see that God intends for those who know Jesus to be like a mirror that actually reflect the glory of the Lord himself. What an amazing possibility. Wow. And you know, the truth is, people are searching. The fact that all the bizarre, upside down and crazy things that are happening today. And by that, I mean like right now today and, you know, this day, this, this era in which we find ourselves. People are searching, often in the wrong places, obviously. But that the craziness that's happening in our world today is happening. It shows that people obviously are searching for something. You know, in your sphere of life and influence, there are people around you who are searching. And they may hear that you call yourself a Christian. In fact, a born again Christian. And though we may not be aware of it, many times they're coming, they're watching, they're looking at you and I to see if there's any reality of him. I want to ask you, what do they see? Better stated, who do they see? Is it just us? Or is there that reflection, that glimpse, that glow, and thus glory, that radiance, that shine, that beauty of Jesus shining through. Do they see him? Now, what do we mean by that? And how does this work? Well, this morning, I'm going to take a different approach to the preaching. Instead of the typical, what we call homiletical approach of three points and a poem, <laughs> I want to do what they called 100 years ago, a Bible reading. Now, it's more than just a running commentary. It is where you go into the context and you're looking for that which is going to shed light on this opening thought. So let's back up to verse 4 and begin to look for these highlights. Verse 4 says, in such trust, that's faith, have we through Christ to God word. So we're talking about faith in God, faith in Christ. Verse 5 is going to describe that faith. It doesn't define it. It describes it. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Friends, these are amazing words. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Of course, he's writing under inspiration, but it is the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, we are not adequate. We are not sufficient for anything. And that grates against our human egos. This is what unsaved people stumble over in the matter of getting saved or salvation. Because it's in the human psyche to think, well, I, I'm good enough. We're all born self-righteous. 
We're all born thinking I'm good enough. And regardless of the fact that we know we stumble and fail and do this and that, we still think we're good enough that somehow God will just accept us. And uh, so this is uh, uh, this is a this is a, a way of thinking that gets in the way of trusting Jesus because you're just trusting in your own goodness. I remember talking to a lady in East Ohio. Uh, she was an older lady. She was a religious lady. Uh, she faithfully went to her, her church and all these things. And she thought that if she was, you know, uh, she, she thought she was good. And she thought her good goodness, her good works were good enough to get her to heaven. And I was be uh, kindly trying to show her that the standard for heaven is God. The standard for heaven, therefore, is perfection. And only God meets the standard of God. All of us have sinned and fall short of that glory of God. And so I was seeking to show her, look, you've got to have perfection. You need Jesus. And she goes, you're not giving me any credit. <laughs> well, that's the point. <laughs> you need the credited righteousness of Jesus, which is absolute perfection, credited to your account. And that only happens when you put your faith in Jesus. Why? Because his, your sins were put on him so that through faith in him, his righteousness can be put on you. That's called justification. That is salvation. But even when you come to understand that and you trust Jesus as your Savior, isn't it interesting how we can go back to self-effort for sanctification? We get saved, justified by grace through faith, and go back to sanctification by works, <laughs> by self-effort. When the truth of the matter is, if you ignore Jesus, the flesh profits nothing. You see, we're not sufficient. Why? Because flesh can't do spirit. You see, there has to be a spirit life for that spirit, a standard to be met. And so he says very plainly, we're not sufficient, but our sufficiency is or from God. There is a sufficiency available in Christ. And so um, have we come to this? Have we come to understand that on our own, we're not sufficient, not just to get to heaven, but to experience heaven on earth. Let's read on. Verse 6, who, referring to God, the end of verse 5, also hath made us able ministers. Now, he's not talking about human ability. He just said we're not sufficient. But when you depend on God's sufficiency, then he enables you, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now, when it says minister here, it's not just talking about preachers. <laughs> Every child of God is to be a minister of New Testament truth. But let's read on. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, often we think of the letter of the law, kills, but the spirit gives life. Have you ever pondered that verse? The letter of the law. God's law is holy and just and good. But the law has no power to enable you to obey it. The law's purpose is not to empower you to obey it. It's to show you when you disobey it. The law does not remove sin. It reveals sin and condemns it. And thus, the letter without the spirit kills. This is why Paul said to the church of Thessalonica, I came not unto you in word only. Fascinating. Obviously, he came with the word. But he says, I came not unto you in word only. Wow, but in power and the Holy Spirit. You see, friends, what we need is the word and the spirit. See, Satan tries to get us into the extremes. There are some who make much of the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. But they downplay the word. That's a bad thing. Because when you do that, you get deceived because truth is the plumb line to discern deception. And so if you make much of the Holy Spirit and you ignore the word of God, then that leads to deception and it leads to strange fire because you go past the, the boundaries of the object of truth that the Holy Spirit wrote. And in the name of the spirit, you've ignored the Holy Spirit. What a deception. Others say, well, I don't want that strange fire stuff. And so they upplay the word. That's a good thing. But they downplay the Holy Spirit. That's a tragedy. 
Because when you have the word without the spirit, it kills. That's what this passage is warning against. It's deadening. It leads to no fire. Now, friends, I understand that in the name of the spirit, sometimes people go beyond the Bible and they get into excesses and it is strange fire. I get that. I don't want strange fire, but I'm going to tell you something. No fire is not the answer to strange fire. Who say, well, I don't want a false experience. I'm going to tell you, no experience is another false experience. What we need is the word and the spirit. That's dynamic and explodes into Holy Spirit revival fire. So that's the emphasis here. Verse 7. But if the ministration, ministry of death, now that's an odd phrase, the ministry of death. So what's your ministry? Well, you know, I've got the ministry of death. <laughs> yeah, there's usually two or three in every church. <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. What is this referring to? Let's read on. It says, but if the ministry of condemnation, or excuse me, a ministry of death, verse 7, written and engraven in stones. Do you know that's a reference to the Ten Commandments? And it is described in the inspired text as a ministry of death. Why? Because of what we just noted. The law does not remove sin. It reveals it and condemns it. The law has no power to enable you to obey it. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to show you when you disobey it. That's why Paul says in Galatians under inspiration that the law is like a schoolmaster. It's like a tutor to show you, hey, you don't meet the standard. Therefore, you need Jesus who met the standard for you. And thus, it is a ministry of death to show you that you need Jesus who is himself life. And so it says, but if the ministration or the ministry of death written and engraven uh, in stones was glorious. That's called glorious. And it goes on to say, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. You remember when uh, God gave the law? And Moses was up there on Mount Sinai. There was a couple of occasions there. But on the one occasion when he came down, he was a glow. And the Old Testament was actually physical. What we're talking about in the New Testament is spiritual. Just as real as if it were physical, but a uh, different dimension. But his face was radiant. Remember that? He put a veil over his face. Can you imagine seeing a human being? And they were so bright. It's like looking at the sun, like the eclipse. You had to get your Walmart $2 glasses so you can look. <laughs> this is amazing. There was glory, even in the law. But look at verse 8. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather, which means more, glorious? See, it's contrast. How many of you know the name of the author from the late 1800s named Andrew Murray? All right. Yeah, several of you do. Absolute Surrender, Spirit of Christ, um, any uh, books he wrote. This text, verse 8, was the text that he preached on when he became the pastor of the church on the town square in Worcester, South Africa. The year was 1860. What an amazing story. You see, that was his first text. How shall not the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious? And within weeks, that church was in an amazing revival, an awakening, a moving of the Spirit. The story and the accounts of intercession that led up to this move of the Spirit are phenomenal. He steps into a, a, a congregation where people have been wearing out a pathway up the mountainside that overlooked this valley town, and they were praying for God to pour out His Spirit on their community. And uh, uh, this is the first sermon that he preaches. How shall not the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious? And within weeks, God began to move. It started with the teenagers. I've been to the spot. I've been to the room where God so moved that all these teenagers broke out into simultaneous prayer. Now, let me say, these were Dutch reformed. It wasn't in their psyche to pray all at the same time. 
But God had come, and God can hear more than one person at a time. And uh, uh, the revival spread to the church, and then it spread to the community, then it spread to the nation. And as that revival continued, they would have services that would just go on. I mean, hour after hour after hour. Why is time lost in revival? Well, it's because when the powers of darkness are banished and the power of the spirit manifests the presence of Jesus. When you are in the presence of Jesus, you are in the presence of the I am who has no time. And that's why hours can go by. And people, we have records from all different centuries and places and parts of the world where they, they step out and uh, like one guy, David Matthews in the Welsh Revival said, uh, 10 hours had gone by. And he said, I thought it was 10 minutes. Now, I've been in some services that were 10 minutes and seemed like 10 hours. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but oh, when the presence of God is there. And there's that awareness that God is in the room. Time is lost. And we're told that these people would often dismiss and go back to their houses. This is night after night at 3 o'clock a.m. Now, you don't have to have a service go to 3 a.m. to say you've had revival. But that is amazing, isn't it? And again, these were Dutch Reformed in their background. This was not in their psyche to have long services. God was doing something. And do you know that we're told that when they would go home at 3 a.m., they would sing their way through the streets on their way back to their house? Can you imagine singing your way through your neighborhood at 3 a.m. and not being drunk? You see, they were so caught up with God, so enthralled with God. So just rejoicing in God that it didn't matter what time of the day or night it was. They sang the praises of God. Is there not a glory in this? And so let's read on. For if the ministration of condemnation, that's the law, death, be glory. It was glorious. It is God's law. Much more. See the contrast. Doth or does the ministration or ministry of righteousness, there's the spirit, life, exceed. See the comparative word in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excels. There's your comparison word again. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remains is glorious. Lord, words could not say this more emphatically. That though there was a glory to the law, because it is God's law, there is such greater glory to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It so exceeds, it so excels, it's so much more. It so eclipses the former glory. It's as if the former glory has no glory by reason of this glory that just far outshines it. Wow. Is that your view toward the Holy Spirit? This is the ministry of the spirit of Jesus. Jesus received the promise of the spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and he sent the spirit. He is heaven's throne gift to us, as James Stewart uh, from Scotland put it. Do we value this ministry of the Holy Do we really look to him as leader? Or do we look to list and box and form and system instead of him? So the text is emphasizing this. This is powerful. So much more. So exceeds. So excels. And then look at verse 12. Seeing then on this basis that we live in this era of the Holy Spirit. This age of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We use great plainness. That is boldness of speech. Do you know when you and I are in step with the Spirit... We can be unashamed of Jesus. We can be unashamed to say what needs to be said. See, boldness is not brashness. We've got that in, in the world. Boldness is freeness. It's the freeness to say what ought to be said in the way that it ought to be said. That's boldness. Now, friends, 
When we're in step with the Spirit, we can use great boldness of speech. Again, not in your face, flesh, obnoxious, shoving truth on people, but being free to the liberty of the energizing spirit of Christ to, to talk about Christ, to say what ought to be said, when it ought to be said, and a freeness and a power involved. It's beautiful, seeing then that we have such hope. That's not your word. Wishful thinking, but confidence and expectation. Why? Because we live in the age of the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, are we in step with the Spirit? Because if we are ashamed to name the name of Jesus when we ought to name that name, we're out of step. D.L. Moody from Chicago, uh, back a century ago, was wonderfully used to the Lord. Perhaps you've heard his name. And uh, uh, they say that he slaughtered the king's English. He did not have that much education. I think it was like a fourth grade education. I do think he was brilliant otherwise, but he did not have much formal education. But uh, fascinatingly, he went to the king's land. England. And on one occasion in London, he put an ad in the paper challenging the Atheistic League of London. This was a league of about 5,000 atheists. And he challenged them to come to such and such an auditorium on such and such a night to hear him preach. This man with very little education. That's amazing. How could you put an ad in the paper and do that? Do you know that out of those 5,000 atheists, 2,000 showed up? Can you imagine being in a service, a preaching service with 2,000 atheists? So Moody says, what hymn do you want to sing? And one of them yells out, atheists don't sing hymns. <laughs> so Moody sang, and then he preached a simple gospel message. Sin is the problem. You need Jesus. And so he explained the gospel. He gave an invitation. Who will trust Christ? Nobody moved. They were frozen. Fascinating. So he said to the ushers, you may open the doors. Anybody that would like to leave, you may leave. No one moved. They stayed frozen. He grabbed his Bible, preached a second gospel message, gave an invitation. Who will trust in Jesus Christ? And one of those atheists pathetically cried out, I can't. Trust Jesus Christ. Again, Moody said to the ushers, you may open the doors. Anybody that like to leave, you may leave. No one left. He preached a third gospel message. Gave an invitation. Who will trust in Jesus Christ? And the leader of the Atheistic League of London himself stood up and in defiance said, I won't trust Jesus Christ. And D.L. Moody pointed his finger at that man. And he looked at that audience and said, there's your leader. How many of you will follow him? Nobody moved. <laughs> and he preached a fourth gospel message, taking an application from the parable of the prodigal son. And when he gave that invitation, who will trust Christ? 500 atheists were no longer atheists. As they put their faith in Jesus Christ and were born again. He kept preaching the next night, the next night, the next night. Before it was done, 2,000 out of 5,000 were born again. It broke the back of the Atheistic League of London in that day. Now, what can motivate a man who did not use the English language well, who did not have that much education, to go to an intellectual center in the world and challenge the intellectuals to come and hear him preach? Is it not obvious that Moody understood that the sufficiency was not in D.L. Moody. But is it not also obvious that he understood that the su sufficiency was in Almighty God through the ministry of the sent Holy Spirit? And because he had such hope, such confidence, he could use great freeness of speech. Friends, that's what you and I need. That's what you need with your neighbor. That's what you need with that relative. That's what you need with that ordinary boss. And it's the same Holy Spirit that Moody trusted in, that you and I can. Now, I realize not all of us have the call of D.L. Moody. I get that. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're a child of God, you have a specific purpose in God's kingdom work that you, through the Spirit, can fulfill by his power. And so the whole point is our sufficiency is of him. Our trust is in him. Our faith is in him. And when that happens, this 
presence of Jesus is manifest. This ministry of the spirit makes truth sink in. Verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. That the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. And until this day, uh, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Now look, look at this. And not as Moses. See, Moses had to put the veil over his face. Jesus moved into our being by his spirit, not to be veiled. But to be manifested. When we are filled with the Spirit, He's manifested. When we're not, He's veiled. Flesh dependence veils Spirit glory. And friends, when people look at us and we are a child of God, and the Spirit of God lives within us, and we veil Him. We rob God of his glory. As Ian Thomas from Great Britain put it, we imprison the son of God within our chest. Now, friends, when you got saved, if you are saved, a divine someone moved into you as a human someone so that the human someone can now be animated by the divine someone. You see, the Spirit brings the very throne life of Jesus right into us to manifest who he is. So that there is something in your voice, something in your eyes, something in your touch that is beyond you. It's supernatural. It's dynamic. It is the Spirit of Jesus touching others with the very life of Jesus through you. That's what this is talking about. Now, friends, this is our privilege. Not as Moses. If we're self-willed and self-dependent, we block the globe. But when we yield to the Spirit's will and spirit dependence, he manifests the globe. Verse 15, uh, I think we read that. Verse 16, nevertheless, when it, maybe we didn't read verse 15, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it, their heart, shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Notice the order there. We would think that the veil would be taken away so that uh, the heart could turn to the Lord, but it's by faith. Their heart turns to the Lord, then the veil is taken away. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit. Did you know the Holy Spirit is called Lord? Hmm. Along with God the Father and God the Son, then why do we often treat the Holy Spirit as a second-class citizen when he's not in the Godhead? And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. The idea of that is where the Spirit is Lord, where he's yielded to as Lord. There's liberty. Liberty. You see, Christian liberty is not the liberty to do what you want. It's the liberty to do what he wants. <laughs> and friends, when you access Christ in you so that you are animated by him, you're actually free to do right. You're actually free. Where the spirit is yielded to his Lord, there's liberty. You're free to be animated and to live to the fullest that God wants you to this side of heaven. Verse 18, but we all with open face, just like a little child. Beholding, that's not a casual look, it's a careful look. As in a glass. Now, notice this is not actually looking into a mirror. It's something that's like looking in a mirror. And when we do, there's the glory of the Lord. And when that happens, when you see him, you're changed into the same image from glory to glory. Notice all these glory words. How? Even as by the Spirit. Wow. Changed. That's the word in Romans 12, too, that's translated transformed. It's the same word in the Gospels that's translated transfigured. When Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration allowed the glory of his deity, which he had set aside to come into our world, he allowed that glory to come back for a few moments and it lit him up. Lit up his outer clothing is the indication of the text there in the Gospels. Who he was was manifested. But in this text, it's applied to you. God wants who you are to be manifested. 
Now someone said, no, 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 I don't want anybody to know. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking who you really are. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There it is. Glory. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, the idea is be manifested. Then will you appear. Be manifested with him in glory. We might touch that later on this week. Friends, the fact is God intends for Jesus in you to, to shine through you. That's the beauty of holiness. It's not some system of religious actions because unsaved moralists can imitate that. It's the beauty of the Holy One himself in you, animating you. So there is a divine look. There's a Jesus look. And that's our privilege. Now in James, the word of God is likened to a mirror. And that is a major way in which when the spirit of God opens our understanding, we see Jesus. We could apply that here. But when it comes to strict interpretation in this passage, the mirror is you. So that Jesus can be reflected. My son is now 21, almost 22. Uh, when he was, I don't know, one and a half, two, something like that. We were in San Francisco for a meeting downtown. We stayed at this downtown church. And so I did not pull my fifth wheel in there, that's for sure. And uh, so we were staying in this uh, prophet's chamber in that downtown church. And to get uh, my son out, I would take him down the street and about every other block to Starbucks or whatever, you know. And so I had my son change, uh, trained in those days. If I put a gospel track in his hand, he would hand it to the nearest person, which got really interesting on the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> and at Starbucks, it opened up some tremendous conversations. And it began a ministry for my son and I that went for several years called Starbucks Evangelism. <laughs> And uh, so a couple of months later, we were over in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I said to my wife one afternoon, I said, hey, I'm taking John Jr. over to Starbucks for Starbucks, Starbucks evangelism. Of course, that also meant for a latte, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> Holy Spirit is practical. So <laughs> I remember walking into that Starbucks and uh, the uh, young lady that was working out there looked up, smiled and said, hello, may I help you? And involuntarily, the thought went across my mind. She knows Jesus. She's a believer. Now, it wasn't based on what she was wearing. I don't remember what she's wearing. She's standing behind the counter. And it wasn't just that she smiled. Did you know that unsafe people can smile? <laughs> but there was a glow. There was that reflection. There was that Jesus look. Well, we placed our order, and I did the standard protocol, put a gospel track in my son's hand. He hands it to her, you know. She grabs it, looks at it, and says, oh, I'm a believer in Jesus, too. And gave a clear testimony. You know what? I already knew. That's that shine. Friends, this is amazing. That there can be this Jesus dynamic in the people who know Jesus. It's not just imitating motions. Obviously, we should live right. The big deal, though, is him. Because when you access him, he lives right. So the focus isn't all the stuff. It's focusing on him. And when he is manifest, then people see him. They see the Lord. I was in a uh, post office. I think it was in Kansas. This is years ago. And I remember I was packed out that day. And I'm standing in line. There's two or three workers there. And this one lady. Now, of course, I've never seen her before in my life. But she was so in love with Jesus. I mean, she was so shining. She was so radiant with Jesus. She had that Jesus look. I, I got to meet her. Got to meet her. So I did. I said, ma'am, are you a born again Christian? And she looks at me. She says, well, well, yes, I am. But how did you know? <laughs> you know, it says of Moses that when his face shone, he wist not that his face shone. See, when you're thinking, <laughs> you know, I got the spirit for life thing down. Everybody's seeing Jesus. They're not. <laughs> but, you know, when you are walking by faith, walking in the spirit, they are seeing Jesus. Beautiful. You say, is that really what it's talking about? Look at the next verse. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Yes. We don't have to use deceitful methods. Verse 2. Verse 5. For we preach, not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord. What does it mean to preach Christ? We say, well, you preach the gospel. Okay, fine. That's obviously a part of it. Is that all? <laughs> I learned this from my father. It's so true. You know what preaching Christ is? 
is that when you speak the words of the gospel, people see the Jesus of the good news. They actually see him. You see, when there's that Jesus look, when there is that dynamic where his life is animating yours, it's more, it, it, it's more than just you. Yes, it is your face. Yes, it is your personality. But there's a divine animation. That's that life of Jesus shining through. And when you give the gospel and people see Jesus, that's what gives the gospel power. Wow. That means there's hope. This isn't based on your intellect. And it's not based on your personality type. It's based on Jesus radiating, manifested. He says, that really what it's talking about. Verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. See, where the mirror is. To give the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now that's odd because you don't make mirrors out of earth, out of clay. You know what that means? It means this is miraculous. And that's the point, because the end of verse 7 says that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I remember some dear friends. He's now with the Lord. But uh, he married a girl out of our church in Ann Arbor. Uh, She was uh, Chinese background and got a Ph.D. and then went to Stanford and they met over there in San Francisco and blah, blah. But at any rate, uh, they had uh, taken a trip to uh, China. It was a three-week trip because of her background and so on. He was from North Carolina, a big old boy with a, <laughs> with a really southern accent. And uh, uh, so they went to this uh, uh, this on this trip, and there was like a, you know, a number of people in their tour group. They had a, a guide. The guide was an atheist, but they were witnessing to her the entire time. And at the end of those three weeks, she said, uh, well, how do we know that your Jesus just isn't your form of our Confucius? To which my friend said, because Jesus rose again from the dead. That's a good answer. And she said, the atheist said, how do you know? (laughs) That's a fair question. Now, historically, when infidels have tried to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, many of them, this is a fact of history, have gotten converted in the attempt. But I love how the conversation went because the atheist guy said, you know, when we all met a couple of weeks ago, all the people in our group, she said, I somehow was drawn to you two. Well, my friend's wife picked up on that. You remember the question is, how do you know he rose again? She goes, oh, if you were drawn to us, there's nothing in us in and of ourselves for you to be drawn to. But Jesus lives. (laughs) See, how do you know he rose again? Jesus lives in us. That's how you know he rose again. There was a long pause. And that guy said, I believe you. 15 years ago, there was another born-again Christian in my group. And the same look that was in her eyes, I see in your eyes. Friends, that's the Jesus look. And people around you need to see Jesus. That's what we're talking about. Obviously, when we access Jesus, we live right. But it's not just living morally, because unsaved moralists can do that. It's more. It's the supernatural dynamic of Jesus shining through you. Remember that opening illustration about the doorknob? There was a purpose behind that. That was dull and I couldn't see a reflection. Friends, sometimes when people look at us, we're so dull, they don't see Jesus. The mirror, as it were, is smeared with sin or self. If we're always griping and complaining and just, you know, murmuring. Well, that blocks Jesus. Bitter, resentful, revengeful. That blocks Jesus. Addictions, habits, obviously all of that stuff gets in the way. It, it, it mucks it up. But even if you don't have the obvious sins of the flesh, if you depend on the strength of the flesh, then the mirror is not facing the object of Jesus. You see, the mirror to reflect Jesus has to face him. And if you are self-focused, then they're just going to see you. And it's time they see Jesus. Are we aglow with Jesus? 